Hey guys, Sean here at the Gardener Center. So this past week, Tracy, who most of you probably know from the garden shop, was on vacation. So I spent a lot more time inside the store in the garden shop than I typically would. And to be perfectly honest with you, the um, air conditioning was a really nice change of pace for me. So that was, it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad at all for me. Um, one thing was abundantly clear on my first day inside the garden shop though, is not only are we knee deep in tomato season right now we are knee deep in tomato problems and tomato problems always manifest themselves around this time every year particularly the diseases but the seemingly endless rain we've been getting here during the month of july is just um it's compounding the problem so this week i'm devoting the entire uh, entire video to a subject that's near and dear to many people's hearts which is tomatoes um, I'm going to talk about three very common tomato diseases. I'm going to talk about something that looks like a disease, but it's actually a cultural problem caused by overwatering, which is something we're probably all experiencing right now. And then I'm going to talk about a really cool bug and how to get rid of him, so stay tuned. First thing I'm going to talk about here is uh, something I've been seeing a lot of, and for obvious reasons, is... Um, overwatering in tomatoes so um tomatoes although they do like water they do not like excessive amounts of water and the amount of water we've had in july so far is definitely definitely qualifies as excessive tomatoes like a lot of water when they're at the first half of the season when they're growing and before they start setting fruit but once they start that fruit set they still need water but they don't like excessive amounts of it and too too much water when the fruit is developing can actually affect the flavor of the tomatoes to the point when they're when they're ready they don't taste that much better than a store tomato um ex excessive moisture is not good when the fruit is developing i mean think about it arguably the best tomatoes on the planet come from that southern half of italy and the reason they're so good is because it doesn't rain much there in the summertime you know late summer when the fruit is developing so excessive water not good for the quality of the fruits when they're when they're developing but it's also not good for the overall health of the plant and a really cool thing though first picture i'm going to share with you here is tomatoes actually give you a little clue when they're getting overwatered before their leaves start yellowing or anything so that you at least know what's going on and this kind of presents itself as a disease but it's not it's just overwatering. so this first shot is a picture of tomato leaf curl and tomatoes that are overwatered, typically the leaves on the top and on the outside will curl upward like that, like you see in the picture there. Um, that's an indication that your tomato is too wet. Um, if it's in the ground, there's not too much you can do about it other than not water it. Ditto for a container, it just hold back on water if you see leaf curl. It'll usually bounce out of that as, as long as you're able to let them dry out not easy to do with the kind of weather we've been having though because as soon as things start drying out we get dumped on with more rain again um the, the, the step after the leaf curl you'll start seeing leaves turning just kind of a clear yellow not with spots or edges you'll just see kind of them fading from green to a pale yellow usually at the bottom that's also that's like the second phase of overwatering and again, not much that you can do about that other than cross your fingers and hope we get some sunny weather. It's just, you know, our climate isn't ideal for tomatoes in the first place and start dumping extra water on them at this time of year. It's just, um, it's just a bad combination. So hopefully the weather will change for us. The weather pattern will change for us and we'll get some hot, dry weather like Southern Italy. So our tomatoes can, can do their summer thing and we can enjoy some, some tomatoes later on that are, that are delicious. Um, so that's overwatering. Next, I'm gonna talk about three diseases. And you know, tomato diseases are really tricky. Um, there's three that are really common. They all look very similar to each other. And some of them look a lot like 
a tomato just like the yellowing leaves from overwatering. tomatoes also as they grow because they're vines a lot of times as the top grows the leaves on the bottom will just turn yellow and fall off naturally because the top of the plant shades the base of the plant so they're really confusing so i'm going to go through these three common tomato diseases and kind of let you know how to tell them apart so the first one up here is septoria leaf spot um septoria leaf spots pretty easy of the three of them to pick out um it looks like lots of little lots of little bullet holes like you see there in the picture um they're not actual holes but they're spots but lots of little small spots um the septoria always starts at the bottom and works its way up to the top of the plant um like like a lot of the other diseases so if you start seeing spotting on the bottom leaves um and i recommend people do this anyways you want to start you want to pick those off as you see them because it's going to go right up the plant like a ladder um so that's you know septoria leaf spot it's as far as tomato diseases go it's not the end of the world um it is brought on mostly by prolonged periods of wet foliage which we are in right now so keep an eye out for septoria if you do see it remove the leaves that have it down at the bottom and then I have our, our Bonide products over here that I've been talking about a lot this year. Again, the uh, Bonide Revitalize and the, um, the Copper Fungicide also by Bonide here. They're both organic products. They're both approved for organic gardening, so you can use them on your veggies. Um, I like the Revitalize for preventing, and I like the Copper Fungicide for eradicating, for getting rid of. So if you don't have it yet and don't want it, they'll revitalize. If you um, have it and want to get rid of it, you want the copper fungicide. And that's going to go for all three of the diseases I'm going to be talking about, not just the septoria. So next up is early blight. Not to be confused with the terrifying late blight. Um, early blight is bad um, and it's common, but it's also not the end of the world. This is another one that presents itself on the bottom leaves first. And if you look at the picture, I actually love this picture of early blight because it's a great example of how it looks and how you could pick it out from everything else. It's always kind of circular in shape like that, larger circles, but you can kind of see those concentric rings. It looks like a bullseye or like the cross section of, of a tree trunk or a tree limb. So if you see a circular shape with rings, you have early blight. And the same thing, it starts at the bottom, so start picking those leaves off as you see them, and then you know hit with the revitalize or the copper fungicide for control. All right, the third one, the worst of all, is the tomato late blight. Um, that the tomato late blight does not winter in Connecticut. Um, interesting thing about late blight versus the other two. The other two can winter over here in debris and in the soil. And then when it rains, it splashes up on your tomatoes. That's how we get it every year. The um, late blight has to be on living tissue over the winter to survive. So that dies completely. When your tomatoes are gone and winter comes around, the, the late blight is gone. The late blight literally comes here on the wind every year. It blows here from southern warm climates. And it's really, it's kind of cool because some years we get it and some years we don't. It really depends on weather patterns. And there's a really, if you're really into your tomatoes and you're really scared of late blight, there is a great website called usablight.org and you can go on there and register it, register, and they will actually show you live outbreak maps of where late blight is and where it's going. And if you're really crazy about your tomatoes, you can even sign up for text alerts if you get late blight in your the area where you're gardening. So it's really cool. And if you're losing sleep at night thinking about late blight, check out usablight.org for sure. You'll love it. Um, same thing, the late blight presents itself very differently from the other two diseases. The other two start at the bottom and work their way up. The late blight, almost looks like frost damage or like gasoline got dumped on the plant it'll just start showing up as brown just randomly throughout the plant and the solution to late blight is to rip the plant up and, and get rid of it get it off the property burn it um it's not something it will quickly infest and kill your other plants it is highly contagious compared to the others 
If you guys remember, um, if you guys remember your history from school, you remember the um, great Irish potato famine in the 1840s. That was late blight. Um, late blight, blight caused that. Tomatoes are, and potatoes are very closely related, and it was that that disease that wiped out the uh, potato crop in Ireland for many years. So that's it's not to be not something you can just get rid of with a spray. So if you see the late blight, and it's really like I said, it presents itself very differently. So keep an eye out for that one. Um, it's not common, and the reason they call it late blight is it is it does happen later. So the other two diseases we like, we talked about like um, warm and humid wet weather. The late blight likes cool wet weather. So it really, once we get into like mid August, when the temperatures start getting a little lower and we start having cooler nights, that's when your late blight is gonna manifest itself. So that's when you wanna keep an eye out for, for that. Um, so hopefully that'll um, help you guys to pick out the differences between these diseases a bit and i'm going to be right back to talk about a really cool bug so stay tuned all right guys so the the good thing although although tomatoes are plagued by different diseases at this time of year they're you know, they really aren't troubled by a whole lot of different insects um insect problems aren't usually a big problem on tomatoes you know in respect to uh, disease problems um, the one that we're seeing right now that you want to keep an eye out for are these guys, these huge tomato hornworms. So this is a tomato hornworm. There's also a tobacco hornworm that looks just like him, only he has an orange horn, but they're both cl um, closely related. And these are the um, larval form of a large moth, and they absolutely love tomatoes. Um, and these guys, as you can see from the picture, are big. Um, and they do a lot of damage to tomatoes. Um, they're, they're feeding right now. There's usually two or three generations of them per growing season. Um, and they do a lot of damage. They do a lot of eating, as you can tell. And they, they are so good at hiding in plain sight. Um, they just, they'll just sit on your tomatoes and you, won't, you can look for them all day long and you won't see them. So some things you want to look for for these tomato hornworms is number one, leaves that are missing. Leaves that, the veins are still there, but the, um, but the, um, the greenery, greenery is gone. The veins are still there, or stems, like the stem here, but maybe the stem is still there, but all the side leaves are gone. First thing you want to look for. The second thing you want to look for is their droppings, which we technically call frass and it is usually black or brown and it's sticky and you'll usually see little clumps or piles of it underneath or on top of your leaves as it falls out of the caterpillar it gets stuck to the foliage so if you see a pile of frass on a leaf and look above that leaf you're usually going to find the hornworm now these guys if you're squirmish um the, the best the best remedy for these guys i'll get to the squirmish part the best remedy for these guys is to scout for them and to hand and to hand pick them. Um, we have the BT here, the um, you know the bacillus, the biological control for caterpillars, which works great, but it only works on them if they're small. Um, these guys are so big. This once they're mature, once they're full size, this does not really do a whole lot of good for them. So the best remedy for them is to look for the damage, look for the frass, and scout for them and pick them off. Um, Wear gloves if you want. They don't bite, they don't sting. And the best thing to do, you know, carry a little bucket with some soapy water, um, throw them in there as you pick them off. Cause if you're squeamish, you may not want to squish these guys under your foot. Cause it's kind of gross, I'll be honest with you. Um, you may just put them in a bucket of soapy water, set that somewhere for a couple of hours, then just discreetly dump their lifeless corpses in some corner of the yard later on. Um, the other thing you could do with them is if you pick them off and you have a big yard or maybe you have a, you live on the edge of the woods you know just pick them off and you know and huck them in the middle of the lawn or the woods and let them try, die trying to get back to the tomatoes they'll never get there somebody will eat them on their way back um so that's a great way to get rid of them if you're super squeamish and don't even want to look at them and you have kids at home go online and invest 10 or 15 dollars in a black light and send the kids out in the garden at night and let them do it kids love stuff like that this is what these guys look like under a black light at night it's really cool 
And I mean, what kids, I, I, just, I just imagine kids getting excited with being given this task. So take advantage of the kids, invest the 15 bucks in the black light and send them out into the garden. Um, so tomato hornworms, they're active right now. So um, be on the lookout for them. Like I said, they're sneaky. They hide right in front of your eyes. Um, before I go, I just wanted to circle back one more time to this rain. So one of the things that happens when we have a lot of excess rain like this, and especially if you're growing tomatoes and other things that are heavy feeders, is a lot of the nutrients in the soil gets leached out. Now remember your plants are using it, but it gets, it gets washed through the soil. So this year especially might be a good time to put a little extra organic uh, garden tone or tomato tone on your veggies. Um, because that, especially the rain we had last week, we had five inches of rain, I think in three hours, whatever was there is gone. So definitely want to replenish that. And another tip I want to leave with you on the tomatoes as we go to the rest of the summer is people love leaving their tomatoes on the vine until they're vine ripened, until they're completely red. Um, I caution you against doing that if we're having excessively wet weather. Um, and something good to know, as soon as as soon as you start to see color on your tomato, that's called, they call that first blush. So as soon as you start to see that red or the orange on the ribs or on the top of the um, tomato, you can go ahead and pick those tomatoes and bring them inside and let them ripen on the counter. And they're gonna taste exactly the same as if you had um, let them ripen on the plant. When you pick them green at the end of the season, they kind of get mealy if you let them ripen on the counter. But as long as they're showing color, bring them inside let them finish in the house before the birds get them or before if we get heavy rain and they're too ripe on the vine they'll just pop open like little balloons so pick them before you water before we get a, a heavy rain and guys as always thank you for watching and i'll see you next week hey,